Okay, we're going to get going. Hold on, everyone. We're going to get going. So the first one is a special presentation on the Clark Fulton Together Plan. Um, Lillian has something to say for. Her. Freddie, um, I'm with the Cleveland Foundation has supported the master planning process with resources. So I'm going to uh, recuse and abstain from the vote. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who's here to present? Are you going to start off, Freddie? Yes, I am. All right, I'm turning off the microphone. Okay, thank you. Testing. Can everyone hear me okay? All right. So I want to uh, introduce uh, the team. Uh, for the Clark Fulton Together Master Plan. Uh, this is a culmination of a very long journey. And it demonstrates how we as a community and how organizations can come together and coalesce in support of a neighborhood vision. And joining me today uh, to present this plan is Councilwoman Jasmine Santana from Ward 14, who will be one of our presenters. Keisha Gonzalez of the Cleveland Foundation, Gregory Zuka from Metro Health Medical Systems, Ricardo Leon. Ricardo uh, Leon is the head of Metro West Development Corporation. Also, Matthew Moss, who's a neighborhood planner uh, for this area for the City of Cleveland Planning Commission. And also, Mr. Wu Kim, who is from WRT Consultants who was the consulting firm working with us. Uh, also today, you're gonna hear a complimentary plan, the 25 Connects, uh, which is a corridor plan for West 25th Street. And joining us today is Mary Beth Feek from the Regional Transit Authority, David Jerka, who's acting as the engagement consultant. And you wanna introduce yourself and your organization Next slide, please. Next slide. So what we want to do today is walk you through uh, the agenda for this uh, presentation. Um, there are some hard copies of the uh, summary of the plan uh, for you to take a look at. We've also provided uh, through WRT and Metro West uh, some hard drives uh, for you to take with you. Um, it's a very robust plan to say the least, and it's a neighborhood comprehensive plan is what I would like to call it. Um, and just to walk you through what we're gonna do with respect to the presentation, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how the Clark Fulton Master Plan aligns with the City of Cleveland's goals and strategies, uh, because this neighborhood is one that is targeted and is intentional with respect to strategic investments. Um, we're going to talk about the Clark Fulton vision. You're going to hear about the partnerships, the collaborations, and the connections. We also have members from the community here who you're going to meet. Uh, we're going to talk about the process, the plan's guiding principles and how we intend to move forward. And also look at what are some of the strategic plays, the catalytic investments that need to be made. And then we're gonna open it up from some Q and A from commission members. Next slide, please. 
One of the things that uh, we wanted to illustrate is the continuity and alignment with what is taking place citywide. Many of you have seen this map, and this is what we call the core redevelopment strategy for the city of Cleveland. When you think about the city of Cleveland and where we're making investments and where investments have happened over the last 16 or so years, you talk about downtown, you talk about the Cuyahoga River Valley, you talk about our waterfront, you talk about Euclid Corridor, Opportunity Corridor, as well as University Circle in our airport. This is where private, public, philanthropic, and other regency, agency resources have been invested to leverage Cleveland's greatest assets. The other thing that I want to point out is the fact that in order to significantly improve the city of Cleveland's prospects, we have to invest in strategic commercial corridor investments. So $200 million has been invested in Euclid Corridor. $331 million is being invested in the Opportunity Corridor. Along the 105th Street, we have 20 million real dollars that's on the table for reinvestment along that corridor. And West 25th is in its planning phase and is a priority as part of a new set of funding opportunities that will be presenting themselves soon. What's also significant about this map are those green areas. And as you can see, Clark Fulton, the neighborhood just off of West 25th is one of our key target areas as part of the mayor's neighborhood transformation initiatives, along with the other green areas. In addition to that, we are continuing to build out around what we call the middle neighborhoods, which are in the yellow. We believe that taking this approach and targeting limited resources to leverage federal resources is going to be key to bringing our communities back. And if you look at the near west and near east side, we believe that the neighborhoods that flank where these investments are taking place are going to be positioned well for growing Cleveland's future. Next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of what it takes just to begin the process of transforming a neighborhood, and these numbers are real numbers. This is the capital investments that have happened in our plan in this footprint. Clark one from Lorraine to West 41st Street, a $7.9 million investment. Clark two, West 41st Street to Quigley, a $7.4 million investment. Fulton Road from Denison to Clark, 5.3 million. Fulton Road from Clark to Lorraine, 4 million. Fulton Road from Lorraine to Detroit, 4.4 million. Scranton Road from Sackett to Fairfield, 2.3 million. Scranton Road and Carter Road from Fairfield to Columbus, 6.7 million. And the West 25th Street corridor, which you will hear about today, is being planned. So we are very serious about making sure that the Clark neighborhood is revived. Next slide. In addition to the infrastructure improvements, there are land investments that are taking place in housing and storefront renovation efforts. And I'm not going to read every one of these, but you can see clearly from housing development projects, um, the beginning of our storefront renovation investments, senior home ownership programs, lead hazard abatement, and the other things that it's going to take to transform this neighborhood. And to this point, there's about $35,960,000 on the land development side. Next slide. Now, what's important about this initiative that you're going to hear is about the strategic collaboration and coordination of city departments as well as agency collaboration. So at the bottom there, where you see this strategic alignment of resources, our goal is to ensure that we get all of the organizations in Cleveland focusing on the same geographies so that we can turn the community faster. And this is happening inside of City Hall, and this is also happening outside, as you can see, with our partnerships. Next slide. What we intend to do in this area is utilize a set of tools and approaches in this geography both policy-driven tools as well as financial tools. 
And this is the universe of those tools that we will be applying and that you will see evident in the Clark Fulton planning effort. Next slide. And as we utilize that kit of parts to transform this neighborhood, we are now at a point where we've come to create the playbook in partnership with the residents in order to make this a reality. So I'm going to turn this over to Councilwoman Jasmine Santana, who's going to walk you through a little bit of the vision, and then we'll proceed with our program. Councilwoman. Ready? Good morning. Thank you for joining us today. This is exciting. After two years of planning and community meetings, we are here. So thank you. Um, so next slide. So I get the best part, the vision, juntos, which means together. This is a map of our Clark Fulton neighborhood. So the vision for Clark Fulton is a community that is safe, unique, welcomes diversity and multicultural expression. We enjoy the fragrance and color of our art, food, and festivals. We treat everyone with respect, regardless of their race, age, and heritage. We love and support our local businesses. We make sure all community members have resources and opportunities to build wealth and age in place. We are healthy, active, with access to quality open space, amenities, and services. We empower people at the be the forefront of the, all decision making. So I also want to mention, you know, as a longtime resident, Park Fulton, very culturally rich, diverse. It's a beautiful place. We're close to downtown. However, as a longtime resident, as a council member, we have many challenges in Clark Fulton. Our housing stock is aging. We're having, you know. Families are being displaced. Safety is an issue. So this master plan is vital and to helping us create a strong and healthy community. So that's why I'm very excited about the adaptation of this master plan. So next slide. So we have about 12,801 residents in the Clark Fulton neighborhood. There has been some gentrification. So, um, you know, for the last five years, the area has seen influx of non-Hispanic white residents. 46% Hispanic, 36% white non-Hispanic, and 15% black um, non-Hispanic. The median family income, it's about 28,000. Um, 41% non-family household, 31% married couples without children. I will tell you, as I walk the neighborhood, there's a lot of single moms as well. 69% um, of residents, you know, 25 years and older and have no college education. So a little bit of history, as you can see, Clark Fulton yesterday and today, um, you know, uh, Clark Fulton was established by European immigrants, welcoming to Hispanic and other immigrant communities build a strong commercial activity, um, develop ageless and strong housing stock. And what we are today is a beacon of diversity um, and unique. No other neighborhood in the West Side is like us. Um, so continuing to be welcoming to the Latino community and other immigrants and communities and preserving our heritage. So um, that is my part. And now I will turn it over to Greg Zuka from Metro Health. Thank you, Councilwoman. Uh, next slide. So again, my name is Greg Zuka. I'm the Director of Economic and Community Development for the Metro Health System. Um, I just want to say that this is really an honor to be part of this process and to be here today to present this, this work that we've been uh, working on so diligently for uh, two years now. Um, <clears throat> and I think it's really, really impactful to look at, at this as a plan that brought together a uh, neighborhood development organization uh, an elected official, Councilwoman Santana, uh, city government um, through uh, Director Collier, uh, Anchor Institution, Metro Health, and Philanthropy through the Cleveland Foundation. And it's just, I think, really, really interesting and innovative to see these organizations, these five organizations coming together to collaborate, to collaborate and collectively create a master plan for a neighborhood. Uh, in addition to that, the, the great work from uh, WRT really helping to guide us through this process. But it was a whole host of others as well. Uh, other 
uh, to gather uh, staff from each of our organizations, but also coordinating with RTA as they were doing their process and their uh, studies on West 25th Street. So it was really critical to have this collaborative effort. Next slide. But I think one of the other really shining examples of this collaboration was the intention and the understanding that we needed to have citizen participation. And not just citizen participation in terms of showing up to a public meeting and counting the number of people that were in the seats, but really engaging with residents in a meaningful way. And one of the things we did in this plan was created a community ambassador program. And these are our five, fab five, as they call themselves. Ebony Joyner, Rhonda Jones, Rodney Llewellyn, Yumari Gonzalez, and Julie Miglarita. Miglarito. Miglarita. Sorry, I was gonna, I knew I was gonna butcher it. Sorry, Julie. Um, and, and these individuals, next slide, they went through uh, a seven course program of learning how to engage their fellow community residents and neighbors and creating a process for how they can go out and listen to what the residents are saying, listen to what the community is saying, and report back and engage the institutions and stakeholders working on this plan. Next slide. Next slide. And after that process, these ambassadors then did their own ambassador expression series where they were trying to identify the needs of the neighborhood and the community. And it was resident led, trying to find out what the residents and the community needs were. And that all that work that they did over the over the two year time frame was integrated as part of the neighborhood master plan. Next slide. And this is an example of one of those sessions. Uh, this was actually one of the last sessions that they had uh, in the neighborhood and the community. Next slide. But in addition to the ambassadors, in addition to the partners that collaborated on this, we also had a whole host of other organizations, stakeholders uh, throughout the community, um, CDCs, development organizations, uh, healthcare, housing, workforce development, economic development, faith-based. So this is really, I think, an excellent example of why this master plan is so comprehensive and so important. Next slide. And with that, I'd like to hand it over to Keisha Gonzalez. Thanks, Greg. So understanding that we really wanted this process to be one that we led uh, with trust, transparency, and accountability, a very robust yet nimble timeline was established in partnership with WRT that captured our desire for this planning process to be um, as intimate as possible with our residents and our stakeholders. Um, and it was broken down into three phases, uh, which was the launch, uh, phase two was ideas and actions, and phase three was the commencement. Um, and what we thought was really most important was that this process was uh, democratized to access planning, which meant that there were multiple opening points for residents to be engaged in. Um, and you heard about the ambassadors program, as you can see at the bottom of the timeline, um, the ambassadors training sessions um, and their expression series ran parallel um, with the uh, with the timeline associated with this. And I would be really remiss not to note that the timeline itself uh, was truly living. Um, as you guys know, we engaged in this planning process right as the sun was rising on the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, so there were a lot of adjustments that had to be made. It was significantly um, expanded uh, and we were just we were able to adapt efficiently um, to allow for a maximum engagement with residents. Next slide. So when we took a look, when we take a look at uh, phase one of the launch, it included a virtual uh, launch meeting, which were con conducted in uh, what I like to say English, Spanish and Spanglish. Um, which was a really critical moment for us to be able to create as many access points, regardless of language, for residents to engage. And this was the principle that was held throughout the entire planning process. Um, additionally, phase one hosted 14 subject specific focus groups that engaged over 120 participants. And what is most important to note about this phase is the extensive volume of historic and real time research. Next slide. Thank you. 
Uh, and so with phase two, ideas and actions brought the opportunity to make engagement tangible through a two day open house that activated over 100 residents and stakeholders. Um, and this all happened alongside of a, well, included a digital, a digital community meeting as well. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? And then with the final phase, which the, was the planned commencement weekend, which was truly a joyous celebration um, and opportunity for the uh, community to engage in a two day open house um, that allowed for a report out of what was truly captured um, by resident input throughout the process. Um, and one of the one of the like most fantastic parts about this was the ability to utilize a lot of our community spaces really effectively and innovatively um, that included the family ministry center, the funk and chip campus and the community fabric itself. Um, as you can see, one of our uh, consultants, uh, Claudia up on the top right was even able to navigate via scooter on um, the community, really bringing in the element of experiencing community um, and celebrating it through different uh, avenues of mobility. And with that, I will pass it on to Ricardo Leon. Thank you, Keisha. Uh, again, I just want to echo, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to be here. It has been an exciting uh, process, and I think hopefully will show the breadth of work that has uh, been completed. Next slide, please. So I'm going to start by just giving the plan kind of framework, guiding element, gui guiding principles. Um, I will touch on the four moves, each each of them independently. So I really won't spend much time here on those. And then I do want to speak a little bit about implementation. So Clark Fulton is a neighborhood that has never had a master plan before, and typically is something that we understand is something that Director Collier really uh, hammered home to us very early in this process. Is the neighborhoods you get are the neighborhoods that you plan for, right? It's only going to be as good as the plan. And so one thing that we really wanted to focus on was being intentional in our process and ensuring that community was a part of the plan, ensuring that we had partners at the table that understood our vision and working together to create a, a, a product, right? A plan that has the highest and best use, right? It was the best opportunity for us. And so our guiding principles were equity and well-being, togetherness, inclusivity and connectivity, identity and expression and resiliency and sustainability. Like I said, I'll get into the forward moves. I'm actually gonna to speak to each of the eight moves individually, but I do wanna talk about our implementation so you can understand how the implementation process is woven in through the forward moves. And so we really looked at a kind of a now, soon, and later approach, right, in, in these ideas. Understand that there are some basic things that we can do now in the relatively short term. There are some more progressive ideas that need substantial work and effort, but can be done in more of the medium term. And then there are transformational ideas, right? Things that will really change the landscape of the neighborhood that maybe will take a little bit more time to come to fruition, but certainly are incredibly important to us. Next slide, please. So our first forward move is to strengthen and create new community places and destinations. We really just sat back and asked ourselves, like, what makes a great neighborhood? What makes a neighborhood that people want to engage with? What makes a neighborhood that folks want to spend time in, want to raise their family and own a home and start a business in? Those are all the questions that really brought us to the table together originally and is the first piece of, of our forward move. And so the idea really here was to strengthen the connection between people and places. In a neighborhood that has historically been disconnected, where folks have not had opportunities, that has been disserviced, under-resourced, we understand the need to put people first and have a resident-centric approach to our planning process. Next slide, please. So in order to do so, we took the neighborhood, right, kind of and understood, understanding where are some key areas. So we kind of divide the neighborhood into seven distinct areas. Uh, you know, and I, I, they're on the screen here, but I'll label them out. It's the Fenwick neighborhood to the northwest, the Fulton West neighborhood, west of Fulton Avenue, the Jones Home Historic District, where Rodney, one of our members, our ambassadors, was here actually, leads the neighborhood association in that community. The Metro Health Campus, the Scran Historic District, Clark and Wallen, and then what we're calling our neighborhood center. And so to get to the, you know, in order to make this work as well, we understand that within all of these sectors, we need to identify, preserve, and restore iconic buildings and the character of the community. Next slide, please. And so in order to do so, right, in order to be able to maintain and restore the community, we also needed to identify and acquire, you know, identify sites that could be acquired and could be potential development opportunities. And so we've done that in each of the sections, but one of the things that we also have woven into this plan is a piece of work that's happening in parallel to the master plan. Uh, Metro West is in partnership with the Fund for Economic Future and working on creating a community investment fund. 
the idea that the community could be at the table and have an ownership stake and in investments that happen in their community and allows residents to have more of a voice in dictating the type of development that happens in the community. And so the underpinnings of this plan are feeding into the community investment fund to identify where those key places are. Next slide, please. So our second forward move is to foster healing, health, and inclusivity for a stronger neighborhood. We need to continue community capacity through our community ambassador program and ensuring that more folks have the opportunity to be connected. We need to retain and support residents to age in place and most importantly, avoid displacement because we are surrounded and bounded by neighborhoods that have seen a significant amount of displacement in my lifetime. And I say this is a lifelong resident. We have to foster community conversations around race and inclusion in the neighborhood. And we need to ensure a healthy and safe life for all residents from all walks of life. Next slide. Please. Our third forward move is to preserve and create housing opportunities without displacement. While this is our third forward move, quite frankly, this is the conversation that comes up the most in every single conversation we have in the neighborhood. We hear it every day. Folks want to make sure that they have an opportunity to stay here. You know, our legacy residents, the folks who've been here 20, 30 years have raised their kids or raising their grandkids. They want to be able to benefit from the investment that happens in this neighborhood. And we believe in that as well. And so in order to do so, we have to ensure that housing stock remains safe, livable, and efficient. We need to find ways to provide home repair grants and loans. We need to identify and support responsible local contractors. We need to utilize code enforcement to mitigate the effects of predatory investor activity. We've all seen the We Buy Houses cash signs. They litter any urban core neighborhood, any neighborhood that has a high POC population. And we need to find ways to get those folks out of our community and create ownership opportunities for the folks who live in our neighborhoods. Next slide. So in order to do so, we've also kind of dug in deep and you can see on the right hand side and you'll see this kind of come up quite a bit. So it might sound like a broken record, but all of this work is based off of feedback from residents, right? We went to the community and asked them. And so one of the things that I thought was really interesting that we did is we looked at those seven districts in the neighborhood and identified what types of housing opportunities are the right fit for that community, right? in order to develop housing supply that meets the needs of all of our current residents, but also our future residents, because we still do want people to move into our neighborhood, right? We want our neighborhood to be invested in. And you can see kind of how we laid out the different housing typologies and how they're spread around the neighborhood. The idea being that our neighborhood will have an opportunity to have housing typologies and price points on a spectrum. Dim the lights a bit. <laughs> Next slide, please. Um, and so in order to achieve this goal, right, this is a big goal, uh, we have to provide financial resources that increase home ownership and retention opportunities. And so that looks like an increase in access to housing vouchers, supporting aging in place, developing accessible loan and debt products, exploring alternative financing models, and developing new funding sources for home maintenance and rehab. In addition, we need to build financial literacy trade skills and education of current and future residents so that our residents are at the forefront in ensuring that their neighborhood stays an affordable place to live while also receiving such investment. And yet again, you can see this is all being driven by what our community has said to us. Next slide, please. And so the final piece in this forward move is creating, you know, the idea around creating a trust or some kind of vehicle land trust that can provide affordable housing in perpetuity. And we spring this up because really there are kind of two pieces of work happening um, within the greater context of Cleveland. In our near west side, there's a near west land trust, which has uh, been designed by some of our partner CDCs, and we certainly want to support that work. But also Metro West is also doing another body of work in parallel to the master planning process with a number of partners looking at the creation of a mixed income neighborhood trust. The idea that we can go out and make investments in residential units at scale and maintain those portfolios as affordable in perpetuity. Next slide, please. So moving on from just housing, we understand that there needs to be economic prosperity, right? In order to build community prosperity through equitable economic and educational empowerment. We need to strengthen and support Clark Fullen's current businesses and connect them to resources and information that they need to thrive. We also have to create opportunities for workforce development and training to enhance those job placement programs and support our Clark Fullen residents. Now, this is work that's already happening. It's not like this isn't happening, but the idea is that it needs to be coordinated and it needs to be happening at a much larger scale than it is today and it needs to be resourced better so that we have long-term impact. 
Next slide, please. In addition, we understand that we need to develop the assets to support the growth of new small scale businesses across a wide sec section of industry sectors, right? Looking at next gen manufacturing, construction, healthcare, arts, technology. And so you can see on the right hand side here some of the businesses that currently exist in our neighborhood. For the Hild uh, Hildebrand, we have Las Villas Deli, which is one of like five or six Latino owned delis in the neighborhood, bakeries. We have the Inlet Dance Theater, which is just outside of here, and the Atlanta Theater, where we're sitting today. Next slide, please. So in order to improve the economic you know, opportunity, we also need to invest in our corridors. And so our fifth forward move is to cultivate unique, vibrant, and prosperous mixed corridors. And yet again, like I said, you'll, I sound like a broken record, but this comes directly from our residents. They want to see better corridors. Next slide, please. So in order to do so, we kind of took a unique approach in looking at, you know, dissecting the neighborhood and the streets that people travel within our community, right? And so we looked at Clark Avenue. That's a, we consider that a place to teach, produce, and create. Fulton Road is a place for small local business, right? Mom and pop shops. Full, the Fulton Gateway, which we talk about at length in the project, is, this, is the very first thing you see in our neighborhood which today is kind of dilapidated, isn't really invested in, doesn't really speak to the nature of the neighborhood. And our hope is that we can create a very unique gateway into the community. West 25th Street, obviously we, we've got a lot to talk about West 25th Street, uh, but our hope is that it'll become a mixed use destination for both health and entertainment. And then Meyer and Sackett, these are two neighborhood streets, right? That folks in our community use every day. And our hope is that this will become, a, these streets will become places for neighborhood gatherings. Next slide, please. So this is a perfect rendering, an example of those neighborhood gathering places. This is the idea of creating a neighborhood plaza on Meyer Avenue, and this will build on the work that Councilwoman Santana is leading around investing around the Meyer pool and really bringing back an institutional piece of public space that has historically not been invested in and quite frankly is dilapidated in. And that work is currently underway today. Construction is happening as we speak. Next slide, please. So again, in order to continue doing this, so we looked at some of the elements that are necessary for this to really happen. And so we have to provide support to property owners for property and safety improvements. We know that's incredibly important. It's paramount to our neighborhood. We have to establish programs that offer uh, support and help stabilize our local businesses. We also have to develop adequate parcel and block infrastructure guidelines that meet the needs of the neighborhood and are respective, re uh, reflective of what the residents want to see. And so on the right hand side here, you can just see kind of some of the elements that we think are important, right? It's the furnishings, it's the lighting, the trees and landscape, the signage, the mur murals, right? Much we need public art and we are gonna continue investing in public art. And then obviously building and facade repairs, improving the physical buildings in our neighborhood. Next slide, please. So again, building off of that, one of the things that we really uh, value and, and it's important to us in the six forward move is creating a connected and accessible and well-programmed public realm network, also being directly informed by residents in the community. Next slide, please. And so to do that, we kind of look at the neighborhood again, looking at our corridors and trying to create a comprehensive open space framework with systematic design tools to implement. You can see on the map here, kind of how all of these play in together. And on, ne on the next slide, I'll speak a little bit more to it. Next slide, please. And so we really looked at four kind of categories, our main corridors, like those main streets that everyone travels, our feature streets, which is actually really unique. It's like the neighborhood streets that folks in our community use every day. And so how can we invest in those spaces? Our greenways uh, promote multimodal transportation and particularly bike infrastructure to make it safer for folks to use uh, other forms of transportation other than a vehicle and our highway crossings, which have historically been pretty dilapidated and uninvested in, and quite frankly, are some of the places that are most dangerous in our neighborhood for pedestrians. Next slide, please. And additionally, as I mentioned, we want to be able to emphasize gateways as opportunities to welcome, celebrate, and engage with the community and our residents. On the right-hand side, you can see some ideas of what we think makes sense, right? There needs to be an identity. There needs to be unifying intersections. There needs to be visibility, and there needs to be unique ways of reflecting the community in our public spaces. Next slide, please. Additionally, we need to provide healthy, flexible, and vibrant new open spaces for all ages. And we'll get to one of the big ones here in the, shortly and later in the presentation, but the reality is that we have 
barely any green space, right? There's very limited green space in the neighborhood. And the few green spaces that we do have, we need to invest in. We need to have place that's flex play and has nature. We need to have opportunities for recreation and sports. We need to have opportunity to display arts, have festivals, have outdoor seating, and it needs to be open and reflective of the multicultural nature of the neighborhood. Next slide, please. So our seventh forward move is to create a safer, smart, green, and connected neighborhood mobility network for all users. Again, this is being directly driven by residents. Next slide, please. And so in order to do so, we've looked at the neighborhood and have created a comprehensive mobility and connectivity framework for all modes and users. Again, relying on that street framework, but then figuring out where we can make enhancements in intersections, where we can make enhances um, to the bike transportation, but you know, figuring out where bus routes and bus stops align so that the neighborhood is accessible as possible to all folks from all walks of life. Next slide, please. So we certainly need to improve and invest in the bicycle network. This these renderings show just some proposed redesigns of some of the you know, busiest streets in our neighborhood to make it safer for folks in our community to use other op mobility options besides just vehicles. Next slide. Please. We also need to redesign key corridors and leverage new development and new investment. We have to preserve and improve the character of our alleys. We are a neighborhood that has a ton of alleys. Unfortunately, they don't get used much and they have very little uh, useful life, quite frankly, in their current state. I think actually Metro West probably spends 70% of our green space budget on alleys in our neighborhood because of how bad they are. And so we need to invest in them. We need to make them better. We also have to be able to increase use of public transit and, and make shelter improvements through regional collaboration. That's why we're here today with RTA. Next slide, please. Then our final forward move, and this is one that really came through, especially during COVID. So it's kind of unique that uh, while we were going through a global pandemic and we had to completely change our approach, it actually shined a light on a massive problem that we have in our community, and that's digital connectivity. So we need to advance efforts to make a more inclusive, accessible, and robust digital resilient community. We have to close the digital divide by focusing on literacy and, literacy and skills development programs. We have to provide adequate investment in infrastructure to support those advancing technologies, right? We wanna be a 21st century neighborhood. We have to partner with local and regional coalitions who are currently working to advance that digital divide. And then we have to position Clark Fulham to be an example in energy resiliency during and after storm events. And so this is my final slide. Next slide, please. And with this, I'll turn it over to Wu Kim and Matt Moss. Oh, actually, I'll turn it over to Matt Moss to talk about the regula regulatory framework, and then Wu will bring us home with Catalyst Sites. Good morning, Commission members. My name is Matt Moss. I'm a neighborhood planner with the Cleveland City Planning Commission. Next slide, please. So this is the slide I wanna to take to all conversations from this point onward when we're talking about regulation in Clark Fulton. It's the city's responsibility to regulate activity, both private activity and public activity. And this includes much of what Ricardo was talking about in terms of how we wanna look at these character districts, these corridors. These are conversations that these, this is the information we want to take to conversations about how we're going to regulate private activity from intention to outcome and also public activity. So that means working with developers to make sure that the products that they're delivering in through the private market meet the community, meet the community's needs and meet, meet residents where they are, but also fast tracking the non market solutions we need that also are necessary for making sure that residents can continue to benefit and grow in this neighborhood. These are this slide represents much of the information that we're going to need to talk with partner agencies like RTA about how we're going to redevelop these corridors and make them more functional, not just for the residents, but to help us realize a future that is more sustainable from a climate perspective, but also for residents to continue to 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 grow their story in this neighborhood. And with that, I'll pass it off to Wu to talk about uh, the next steps. Thanks, Matt. Good morning, uh, Cleveland Planning Commission members. My name is Wu Kim. I'm a principal at WRT, which is a planning and design firm headquartered in Philadelphia. Next slide, please. So I just have a few slides here, and uh, I'll try to summarize um, how this master plan sort of applies itself onto sites, or rather zones. Uh, there are five zones that we're targeting within the Clark Fulton neighborhood. 
the first zone is the Makers and Artists Avenue zone. Um, and as you know, and we want to celebrate the industrial and manufacturing heritage of this neighborhood. Um, and so we want to retain much of that as possible and turn that into uh, future uses uh, for entrepreneurs. Um, and that's the focus of this zone. And many of those buildings are fully functional now and very vibrant. The next zone or the site is the neighborhood center. Um, and this really is the heart of the Clark Fulton neighborhood. Many of the developments are underway. Um, and this is just a visualization of what is possible. This is not a, a, an idea for land acquisition or anything like that, but we needed to provide a vision for residents and for stakeholders to get behind. The third site is the Fulton Gateway site, as you heard Ricardo talk about. It is one of the most prominent um, intersections or corners of the neighborhood. And right now it doesn't quite sort of befit its gateway status. And so this is an idea, an example of how it can be turned into a triangular park uh, with buildings around it to create a sense of place. The fourth site is the Life and Entertainment Center. Um, and this is where the Funkin Ship campus is. Uh, and many of the uh, sort of the, the entertainment venues along Sackett Avenue uh, can be. And so it's important to provide a sense of uh, diversity of uh, catalyst sites and activities within this neighborhood. And finally, the Metro Health Park is a, is a large catalyst site. And Greg will come up to say a few words about that. Next slide. I'll go into detail here. Um, as I mentioned, the Makers and Artists Avenue site stretches along Walton Avenue and Clark Avenue, connecting St. Mary's Cemetery, Hildebrand Provision, Astro Building, where we're at right now. Uh, the Neighborhood Center um, contains uh, many of the buildings that are uh, soon to be implemented, such as uh, Centro Via 25 uh, and many other mixed-use developments coming online. This is also really important with the next presentation that you'll hear, which is a 25 Connect uh, presentation, the BRT line along 25th Street, and the potential for lots of mixed-use development and activity along that corridor. The Life and Entertainment Center, as I mentioned earlier, is a focus of our catalyst sites, and then the Fulton Gateway, um, as I mentioned earlier as well. With that, I'll hand it off to Greg to just say a few words about the Metro Health Park. Next, next slide. So I just really want to just, uh, as Kim will go into the design, um, just want to uh, express really why uh, Metro Health got involved in this in the, in the first place. I, I think early on in 2018, um, as Metro West was starting to come into its own as, as an uh, uh, independent functioning um, community development organization, um, they were starting to look at some planning efforts and Metro Health, as, as we were starting to uh, look at some ways that we can make investments in the neighborhood and the community, we also were thinking about looking to do some strategic planning, uh, community planning. And, and there was at that point that that we talked with uh, Director Collier and uh, Keisha, and we all said, well, why don't we just put our money together? Why don't we just do this collectively rather than having separate plans and studies that are gonna look at this? Um, and so it was really important for us that the Metro Health Park was part of that neighborhood plan because at the end of the day, we want this park to be an asset for the neighborhood and the community, to be integrated into the community and not to be a barrier between the campus and the neighborhood, but to be that place where the neighborhood comes together, where health and well being and all these ideas come together and it really creates an intergenerational space and a welcoming space. And so it was really important for us to be part of this plan so that we could have this, this park come to fruition. And you'll, you know, there are some things that will be coming before this, this committee uh, in the coming weeks um, that are really critical in order so that we can make this, this possible. Um, so we need to do some, some uh, additional development on the campus um, so that this park can come to uh, be a reality. So I'll hand it back to Kim to talk about the, the uh, to talk about the design. That's great. Um, as Greg mentioned, this is a concept for the Metro Health Park, and the idea is around four different rooms uh, stitched together by a serpentine sort of trail or spine. The first room is the Metro Health Green. It's a large multi-purpose lawn, green, and athletic field. 
the second room is the welcome plaza. Um, it's really the sort of the welcome center for the park. The third room is the Clark Fulton Commons, and you'll see a rendering of that in a few slides. And finally, we have the tail end of the park here, which is the South Gateway, which is an opportunity for us to create another gateway coming uh, north from 25th Street. Next slide. So, like everything else that we've done through this two year journey, we've um, asked the community what they would like to see in their park. And resoundingly, the community has told us that they want to see markets and festivals on this park. They want to see more greenery um, and they want to see sort of plaza seating areas. So, really, just a, a diversity of uses across all the seasons for all age groups in this very large 12 acre park. Next. As I mentioned earlier, the, the serpentine sort of trail that connects the four rooms is a half mile line, uh, which is great and goes along with our goals and forward moves for healthy community lifestyles. And finally, the art and culture component cannot be sort of understated given the room that we're in and the character of this neighborhood to make sure that we celebrate those components within this park as well. So you can see some of the precedent images that we brought up uh, to celebrate art and culture within this park. And this is the last slide of our presentation. And this is a rendering of um, the Metro Health Park from that third room that I mentioned to you looking out. So you see the BRT bus in the background there going down 25th Street when that BRT line is implemented along with a revitalized corridor. So I'll just take this moment to thank you so much. And uh, it has been an extremely uh, humbling and, and a great opportunity for me to work on this project. Thank you so much. Thank you, commission members. Sure, um, I, I would expect uh, Mr. Chair that Metro Health will be before us or an official presentation concerning the green space. Um, and second, this would not be a planning commission meeting unless there's some social commentary. First of all, excellent plan. It was very well thought out, very intentional and thoughtful. I have one issue. Um, I believe in the future, plans that are developed in RFPs that we create a youth community council on every plan. Um, it's, we need to hear their voices. They're our greatest asset. They're going to hear what we're talking about. Um, and more importantly, they need to be in that space. They need to understand what it means to, to go through that process. They need a seat at the table, have a real life example. My 19 year old a college student, my wife and I, to his chagrin, dragged him to community meetings. We dragged him to landmark meetings, design review meetings, board meetings in the community, and it has paid back. My son now, sophomore in college, tutors incoming freshmen, chemistry, calculus three, and physics. So I know it works. So we have to be more intentional. And lastly, gatekeepers, get over yourselves. You're not losing power. You're gaining thought leaders. Thank you. Our commission members. Just kind of wondered if you looked at this as a blue zone, so, um, you know, health would be more intuitive. You know, this passive healthiness would be more intuitive. Have you looked at it as a blue zone? Um, actually, I'm probably not best to answer that question. Um, I think Greg, maybe. Um, so, um, not so much a blue zone, but one of the, one of the things that we've been doing as part of this is um, pursuing uh, eco district certification so that we've been using the eco district platform and protocol to be the underlying platform in this work to really help to guide the implementation so eco districts is not a prescriptive way for neighborhood uh, systems level change but really what it's about is the process and collective impact understanding that we have to do a plan and implementation through the lens of equity and inclusion through community resilience and climate protection and sustainability. And so that's really kind of underpinning this plan and it's gonna to help to guide us as we move forward 
to implement this. So in parallel to this planning effort, uh, we completed the first two steps of the eco district certification. Um, and we're wrapping up now the final piece of that, creating a roadmap that will really be that guiding principle. So throughout this process, we, we've, we've been meeting as a core team. So the, the five partners, we've been meeting on a biweekly basis. And even though this plan is done, and even though we'll, we'll succeed in, and become certified in eco districts, we're gonna continue to meet. We're gonna continue to work together to make sure that we continue to al align ourselves and that these plans uh, and these strategies don't just sit on a shelf and collect dust, that we continue to work. This is when the work really starts. No, a great answer, but I'm looking more towards wellness and kind of the intuitive wellness that can happen in a city. And there's other cities doing it. So I ask you to take a look at that. Thank you, Chairman. Uh, if I may, I do want to emphasize something that I think as a community is really starting to become ingrained in our DNA. I know it's uh, part of what the city's work is, it's part of what Metro's work is, as well as the foundations and others. Um, looking at how we make decisions and understanding that health starts where you live, work, and play. So the social determinants of health framework is embedded throughout this plan. Um, one of the things that we are looking at right now as we go into our comprehensive plan update is really looking at health as the ultimate metric for how well we do community. By virtue of working with Metro and some of the other organizations, we're really starting to try to connect health outcomes to place. And I think that was a very important point that uh, the Metro Health Systems, um, the city and everyone was really thinking about was what is the human impact of this? Um, there's still a lot of work to do with respect to health data and really connecting the social, economic, environmental factors or root causes of certain health outcomes in our neighborhoods. And that is something that we wanted to bubble up in the surface, to the surface as you read through the documents and as you look at your flash drives, I don't know if you have the fortitude to read the document in its entirety, but if you start to focus on some of the key principles and some of the strategies, you'll see that social determinant of health sort of framework permeate uh, throughout this particular initiative. Figure out if I, there we go. First of all, thank, thank you so much for bringing this to us today. And I'm, I'm really excited by this space uh, and, and I've, I've never been here before and, and I hope to be able to kind of take a quick gander at it on my way out just because it's such a great community asset. And, you know, I think it, it was really telling uh, when Councilwoman Santana kicked it off and just showed us the aerial map of the neighborhood and uh, really by design showing how this neighborhood was cut off from surrounding neighborhoods by the interstates and was really for, formulated into an island. And then part of the challenge has been how, how it integrates back in with the city. And what I think we see here in this plan is a great opportunity to uh, build upon the strengths of such a strategically positioned neighborhood and, and not just a strategically positioned neighborhood, but for, for as diverse as the city of Cleveland is, uh, the city has historically struggled on being integrated. And, and while that has improved in many areas, in some areas, it, it's still a challenge. This is one part of town where really diversity uh, is alive and celebrated and, and demonstrates to the rest of the city, um, you know, that what the path forward is. Um, so so I, there, there's a lot of inspiring things. Uh, two, two quick questions. Uh, and, and director, this is, I guess, more of an update. What's what's the status of plans to build infrastructure along Train Avenue for uh, bike multimodal? Because I, I noticed, theoretically, if anyone's ever gone down Train Avenue, it's a bit of an adventure. Uh, but it, it pulls you. It's 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 this natural valley that follows an old creek uh, that's been culverted, but dumps you right down into the towpath on Scranton Road. And, and it'd be really excellent for the northern parts of this neighborhood to be able to have that access point into the regional trail network as well, because the towpath is so close to where we are right now, but accessibly, it's, it's, it's very distant. 
So I'm going to start off and I'm going to turn it over to our resident uh, bike and pedestrian guy. We have two individuals on staff who you all know are very adamant cyclists and uh, Matt Moss is one of them. But with respect to Train Avenue, the plans are still on the books for playing Train Avenue. Now, the second part of that is the funding commitment. Now, one of the things I laid out, you know, in the beginning is that we have a true commitment to infrastructure improvements and the bike and pedestrian infrastructure scenario is going to be a part of that. In our minds from the planning departments, we are advocates for uh, multimodal investments in really bringing those to fruition. And I know from our perspective, Train Avenue is a big part of that. Uh, with respect to how funding is going to be divided up, the verdict is still out on that. I know you guys have some decisions to make next week in front of council uh, with respect to uh, ARPA dollars. But I think the big thing that we need to be focusing on as a community right now is the American Jobs Program and the uh, dollars that that's going to bring to our neighborhoods and to our community, because that is where the bulk of those resources are going to come from for the trail projects, for the road projects and things of that nature. And I think that's why it's so timely that we're positioned to know exactly what we want to do, particularly in the Clark uh, Fulton footprint. I'll turn it over to Matt to talk to you more specifically about training. Thanks, Director. This is again Matt Moss with the Planning Commission. The only thing I would add to that is, is these plans that we develop for trail networks, we're always iterating them and having to work with partners like the Metro Parks, for example, to fully implement them because of the scale and the cost of these projects. But Train Avenue is a great example of a plan that now that we have assets like the Towpath Trail connected and funded and, and being fully completed through to downtown, now that we have this neighborhood plan with Clark Fulton, that's where we can come in and take that other planning document for Train Avenue, which still has value, even though it was done several years ago. That's a conversation we can then fully are fully prepared to have with the community about how they want to connect. And then we have options to present them that can finally go from a plan on a shelf to a project that could be realized through various funding applications through uh, perhaps new federal transportation funding applications through the NOACA TLCI implementation funding applications. So these are now options that we feel are open because we have these documents that can help guide us to making sure that it's not just a connection, but it's a connection that the community will own and use. And, um, yeah, I just, it's, I, I'm really hopeful uh, that, that that project comes online. It'd be a really catalytic connector for not only Clark Fulton, but also West into Stockyards and, 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 and connect, connect people in, in the different assets of the Cleveland neighborhoods. Um, you know, the other thing I'm, I'm, I'm very much intrigued by the end of the presentation and, and this uh, uh, park between 25th and Scranton. Uh, I, I realize it's there, there's a lot of externalities. There's the women's pavilion. I believe there's a, a church on part. And I don't know. So we'll we'll see how this unfolds. But um, you know, part of what it reminded me of Acacia years ago in a kind of our previous roles when we were meeting about the, the you know uh, down the street at the Hispanic Alliance and talking about the origins of La Placita, which has come online. But I, I recall that that one of the intents was in. Uh, you know, most of Latin America communities have a central plaza and that that's really the focal point of the community. And I'm not sure how this would be programmed or, uh, you know, what the, you know, the, what the future of it would be from the programming standpoint, but it seems intriguing that this is an opportunity to kind of create that central space in a very visible central part of the neighborhood uh, and, and in, in, in uh, a neighborhood that it was mentioned uh, doesn't have as much green space as maybe some others do. So, so that I, I thought that was a, a cool, uh, 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 <laughs> a, a good, a, a, it pulled me back to those conversations and, and just thinking through what can be done to celebrate, um, you know, what really, I would certainly Northern Ohio, but arguably Ohio is really at the center of uh, Latino culture. Uh, so I'm, I'm excited to be part of those conversations as they unfold. One thing, um, as, as we begin the program and figure out where we're going to spend money, please know that in red line areas where black and brown people live, it's going to take more than we think. Yes. We have to look at this as deferred maintenance. Yes. So please know that. I don't know what the administration is going to be, but that's got to have a serious conversation about that. Thank you. Well, if the next administration is about equity, then you just described it. 
And part of what we wanted to show in the beginning was the targeting uh, targeted approach that we're taking was really based on these legacy policies and the neighborhoods that they've impacted, which is those NTI areas, the near east, near west side, and we're being intentional about adding the supports. And that's one of the reasons why we wanted to illustrate the amount of investment, the monumental amount of investment that it just takes just with the infrastructure to even scratch the surface with neighborhood transformation. And I think we got a lot of work to do, but we have to double down on that. So it's my hope and prayer, to be quite honest, that the next administration continues to capitalize and build on that premise and that it is not lost. So thank you for that. Thank you. Um, job well done. I move to approve the plan um, as presented. Second, and I think that all of you should celebrate the wonderful work that you've done and how transformative this implementation will be for this neighborhood. Congratulations to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Mr. Chairman, a uh, point of privilege, if I may, um, there are, um, and Joe, is there so many, any comments or questions in the chat uh, from the public? Because we have about five minutes we wanted to devote just to hear comments. Um, again, this is live streamed, so people will be able to go back and see the proceedings and also uh, submit any commentary on the City Planning Commission website. Uh, and we will record all of the uh, commentary in the chat and respond to each one of those uh, elements uh, through staff. So we're going to take five minutes, if we may, just to take a few questions, if there's any. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to make a comment or ask a question? Just want to provide the opportunity. Right. No one's chatting. It's okay. great to have this kind of presentation in this kind of space. I mean, this is really, really important. I'm glad to be out of the house. So, I'll call the question. Uh, Michael, call the roll, please. Yes. 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 Motion carries. Good luck. Thank Looking you. forward to the Thanks. next side of this. Hopefully it's the park in front of Metro. <laughs> Um, commission members, uh, this next presentation is uh, equally as important. Um, one of the things that we talked about in the beginning is linkages. Um, and transportation access is obviously pivotal, uh, not just to get people from place to place, but also uh, as an economic development tool. And uh, it's very important that the environmental stewardship associated with infrastructure investments is acknowledged as well. So this next presentation is going to be around the 20... Uh, uh, five connects plan. We have uh, Mary Beth Feek from Greater RT, Greater Regional uh, Cleveland Transit Authority, Craig uh, Slenner, Sklenner, I'm sorry, from Stantec, and David Jerker from Seventh Hill, along with uh, Matt Moss, uh, neighborhood planner. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Mary Beth Feek. I'm the director of planning. It's great to be here. It's great to be in this facility. I remember it was when it was an astrophony um, place where you could actually get awnings. For me as a planner, this is a great day. You cannot see a better integration of land use, planning, and transportation. This is, it's all coming together and it's great to see and it's great to be part of it. We've been working together with this plan for about over a year now. Um, our stakeholders were their stakeholders. Our, um, our participants were their participants. So we've worked together. Actually, the city of Cleveland, Metro Health, and Clark Metro helped us select this consultant committee. They presented to our board when we were ready for it, and we've been on their stakeholder committees, they've been on our stakeholder committees. So this is really working together, and I'm gonna just talk a little bit, and then Craig and David will take away the presentation. So let's get back in. Um, let's talk about transportation. That's where I'm gonna focus. Um, on 25th Street. Our corridor runs from basically the end of the Detroit Superior Bridge down 25th Street, ends about the second 
campus, uh, the Deaconess campus of Metro Health, which is where State, Broadview, and Pearl all sort of meet. That's where we end. RTA's new mission statement is um, we RTA connects communities. We do connect communities, and there is no better connection. I'm trying not to feedback um, than 25th Street, R51, our Metro Health line. Um, it connects downtown to five, through five neighborhoods, and you'll see what those are. And then it goes on to connect through five additional suburbs into the county line. Um, it is our next redevelopment project. You've heard us in the last three, four years talk about rail cars. You've heard us talk about um, doing infrastructure and rail cars and ADA. We have not done anything new. This is it. It gets 1.7 million boardings a year, and that's pre-COVID. That is, the, the health has 3.4, so it's almost half of that, and it outranks the blue and green line for boardings a year. That's how important it is to our system. It leverages the investments that you've heard on Metro Health, as well as those going on in Irish Town Bend, in Ohio City, and then what's going on in Old Brooklyn and further on into the county. It, what I like the most is that it treats all of 25th Street as a unified transportation corridor. If you drive just the corridor that I've told you, you'll see streetscape that has um, come up in Old Brooklyn area, then it'll, go, then it'll be something different, and then it'll go to a desert. I don't think we've seen one street tree when I've done any of my walks on uh, 25th Street in the areas that I've been on. So it's going to unify it all. It's also, as a planner for RTA, it is our part of our priority corridor network where we've identified the areas of improvement for transit routes and corridors throughout the city and throughout the county. This is number two. We finished Clifton. We're now on to West 25th Street or 25 Connects. Go on to the next slide. What this does is this was actually funded by FTA, a TOD pilot planning program and project. Um, it sets the stage. It creates our, um, our portrait of what's going to go forward in the next five to seven years as we go into design and construction of 25 Connects, a BRT-like project down 25th Street. It establishes a, a level of what after a lot of input from the public, what they might want to see in a bus station, what they're, where they want it to be. It engaged, just like um, Clark Fulton, we engaged the community. And you'll hear from David, we started, I, I saw Craig when he gave a, uh, his presentation, and then when we ended the project a year and a half later because of COVID. Um, it's consistent with all the citywide plans. I wrote the statement, um, the neighborhoods, the mayor's initiative, the citywide plan, the land code that's coming up, this project is right with it. It is consistent with the Clark Fulton Connects plan, with just about every plan the city has ever written. Um, this is very consistent. It leverages development. That's something a BRT wants to do. You've got a lot of development now, and it's going to keep going into the future. And we got a lot of pub uh, feedback about public transit. Um, given this COVID, we're kind of shy about asking people what they think about RTA because they might tell us, no, uh, because uh, we hear a lot about bus stops and bus shelters, but we got a lot of great feedback about our service that we haven't heard before. And go to the next slide. So to set the context, uh, you'll hear what we've done. We've looked at um, the land use recommendations. We've made some. We looked at all of those zoning applications that were done and how many, how many times they had to have those variances all along the corridor. We also looked at TOD, looked at TOD where it should be in all five neighborhoods. Everyone is very, very distinct. What could be marketed? What should be? We look at the land use and then we also bore down onto some vacant lots of what developments that were multifaceted that could support transit as well as a neighborhood. And we established a whole new level of coordination between the city of Cleveland and RTA. As I told you, we worked together on everything. We had monthly calls on land use and zoning. We, um, poor Rob, I think worked for us a lot of the time. We've talked to Freddie many, many times, as well as Metro Health and Ricardo. So we really did, and we're ready to go forward. All of the, the zoning applications, everything that you saw on Matt's last slide, 
is in this, and we're going to perceive like that is our pathway forward. And we established a lot of great partners. So with that, I am going to give it over to Craig Slinar. Good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Craig Sklenar. I am an urban designer with uh, Stantex Urban Places Group. I'm based out of the Montreal office, but I have uh, over 17 years experience working both as a public sector urban planner uh, for municipalities and in the private sector that primarily deal with that interface of land use and transportation uh, infrastructure itself. And so uh, we've actually shifted our practice from transit oriented development to transit oriented community practice, uh, because that's really where we sit is understanding that framework between uh, how community planning and transit uh, work together. And I'm really excited to be here today and thank you for your time uh, through this. So we'll, we're going to flip through uh, where we where we are and in, in, in our process. Uh, and, and what we learned, this really was, as Mary Beth said, uh, funded through the FTA, an investigation of uh, how, uh, what, what potential barriers might be to uh, developing transit supportive projects along a corridor, uh, what elements uh, uh, that in the physical realm need to be considered if we're going to be inserting a new bus rapid transit. And it's a very unique opportunity because a lot of times when we do a transit project, uh, we get very far down the way in, in engineering, and then we start looking at land use planning. And this allows us to really fuse those two processes together. And we set a foundation that when preliminary engineering begins next year, they have a guidebook to say, here are the things the community has a concern about. Here's some of the physical uh, uh, constraints of the corridor and land use considerations that when uh, that engineering process continues, they can drive down into those things and, and they're, they're already primed and ready uh, uh, to meet the, meet, the, meet the road, I guess, in that sense, uh, because the infrastructure is going to be really important along this urban corridor. Uh, next slide. So. I uh, just want to go through project history here. As Mary Beth had said, this is this started in 2018. Uh, we did most of our work uh, right at the apex of, of when uh, the pandemic started. Uh, and we're here today at, at, at uh, 25 Connects uh, at, at the end, but know that this continuum will continue in the, in the physical design of the BRT. Preliminary engineering and design will happen through uh, 18 months starting in 2022 with BRT construction, hopefully starting in 24. Operation in 26. Just want to just want to pause a little bit and, and also recognize that at our Stantec team, it's, it, we have in, uh, international experience that are coming together uh, across our group. Uh, everybody from our Boston office, uh, we have uh, mobility experts that, that work within this uh, land use planning uh, and, and our financial uh, and market readiness uh, group out of the New York office uh, as well. And uh, and I'm I'm based out of the Montreal office. We also have David Jerka and his team uh, uh, for public engagement. I really want to appreciate uh, and take the time to say thank you for your dedication and hard work. And and much like uh, Clark Fulton together, we also had our own ambassadors and street team uh, that we activated uh, to get people to engage uh, uh, during this process. I'm gonna just pause here too. Uh, I think. We all can appreciate the crossover, both of Clark Fulton together and the work that we're doing. Uh, it really does take community partners and, and uh, stakeholders uh, working together to make sure we're all communicating the, the right uh, messages and understanding the right need of community members. So thank you to everybody at, at Clark Fulton uh, uh, together that have been engaged in that as well. And fusing on what we're doing, even though it's a broader corridor work that we're doing, it was really important uh, in, in that sense. So as stated before, our purpose is to understand um, how the transit project can be inserted and implemented, but also understanding the return on investment in that sense of uh, attracting new uh, developments, the barriers to that, to uh, how new development could happen, ensuring that that uh, uh, as development occurs, we're not displacing or or uh, uh, pushing people out that currently live in these communities, but we're welcoming new new members into these communities in, in new and creative ways. Uh, and then uh, engaging uh, stakeholders in the community to understand what transit means to them and then what new development or improvements the community may, may uh, mean to them as well. 
And we do call this 25, if we can just, sorry, go back to that one slide. We do call this 25 connects in the sense that we wanted a branded name. Uh, and, and when we looked at the corridor too, it's, it is divided by unique neighborhoods, but it also is connected by 25th Street itself through bridges and, and, and it's been the sort of lineage on the west side in that sense. And so we wanted to make sure there was a unique identifier in our engagement process uh, and, and uh, creating that, that community connectivity. These are our four plan components. We have the BRT development itself. Now our FTA grant doesn't allow us to do capital improvements, but we used that time and understanding of current operations, ridership, we're looking at parking in the area to understand current parking supply, even in a pandemic. Uh, we wanted to understand off street and on street parking utilizations during these times. And uh, with two major medical uh, destinations along the corridor, we still we still want to understand those those pieces and understand the, the real or perceived uh, barriers to uh, parking strategies along the corridor, pedestrian and bicycle infrastructure as well. Uh, we did a deep dive in zoning and policy. Uh, what is what does business look like at City Hall for new development, uh, existing uh, properties? This is a historic urban corridor, uh, and we'll show you some slides there. But we really drove down into some recommendations that can dovetail into the work that that Matt and his team are doing at City Hall with the new form based code land code uh, uh, upgrades, but also just how do how do we look at new development and coordination with RTA and the city itself? We wanted to understand there was already a market study done uh, for the corridor to understand um, the market potential or what we were going to see. And we'll, we'll show a little bit of that here, too. But th but the story there is each neighborhood has very unique um, needs and, and different uh, conditions when it comes to market readiness for new development. And so we wanted to uh, make sure that we had the right toolkits that meet those challenges uh, for each geographic region. And then lastly, we had a robust engagement process that really fed into everything that we did and we created a what we heard report that provided sort of the community recommendations moving forward with this project. So we had, we had five sort of reports that went into the, those themes uh, and they, they are various levels of, of detail uh, based on this and we received copies of these. Uh, and, and so the rest of our presentation is just the high level review of these and our, and our recommendations. I'm going to turn it over to David to talk a little bit about our engagement process. All right, thanks, Craig. You want me to grab that? <laughs> Good morning, Commission members. Um, and thank you, uh, live studio audience, for being here today. Uh, I'm really excited to share some of the highlights uh, from the project, um, specifically the engagement work. First of all, I need to uh, underscore and give an additional shout out to our uh, engagement team, which included uh, Roberta Duarte, who focused on the ethnographic research. Um, and we had Jacinda Walker, who developed uh, the brand identity, and uh, Sonia Matis, who focused on community engagement, primarily on the southern half of the corridor, um, particularly with the Spanish-speaking community. And then Diane Howard, who's a resident of Lakeview Terrace, who was uh, really instrumental in getting our engagement numbers really high uh, within her community and the northern half of the corridor. So first of all, uh, I wanna say that we began the project by being clear about our engagement goals. Uh, we knew that with COVID coming online, we had, to, we had to adjust our engagement strategy so that at the end of the process, we could trust the results and that the community would also trust the results. So that meant creating clear qualitative and quantitative engagement goals. Um, some of those are here uh, on this slide right now, uh, primarily the quantitative ones, but I also wanna uh, make it clear that uh, much of the qualitative engagement goals uh, came through the ethnographic research, which is something that Roberta uh, led towards the beginning of the project. And basically what that means is having one-on-one -on -one conversations with residents in the community, primarily residents who don't speak English. It meant riding the bus. It meant observations along the bus um, and helping uh, us to get in, uh, insights that then could actually inform the engagement plan before it was set. So in terms of some of the qualitative, uh, some of the quantitative um, goals, we knew that um, we had to come up with a few different ways um, to uh, ensure that we reached everyone. Um, so we did a deep dive into demographic data for the entire corridor. Uh, we looked at gender, age, 
uh, racial uh, and um, also income diversity so that as we went through the engagement actions, we could track who's participating along the way. And then as we saw needs or deficiencies and engagement in one dimension or another, we could actually put those actions in place so that at the end of the process, we hit our goals. So some of those goals that we set were to distribute a certain number of uh, items. We surpassed that goal. We aim to hit about 440 participants to be involved in multiple times through the project. And that's basically like 1% of the corridor as we defined uh, the, the number of participants. So we actually exceeded that by quite a lot. Uh, we uh, implemented uh, 22 organized events with at least seven in each of the three phases, which was important given COVID. So one of the shifts in our strategy was rather than have fewer large number events, we had to kind of decompose that into multiple small scale events in person, which included mobile tours, uh, user experience walks with individuals, surveys, and um, social media, knowing that some people may not want to participate or may not uh, have the time dedicated to the project, but we wanted to make sure that they were at least informed or heard about the project so that as things come online in the future, they have a touch point for it. So we track that through impressions, and those were geofence social media posts within a two mile radius of the center of the neighborhood and website hits and tracking um, where people are coming to. So uh, that's a, a bit of an overview of how we were tracking tracking the data and how we created it. Next. So what did we hear? For simplicity's sake today, uh, we heard a lot, and we're going to just uh, present these into four kind of buckets. One was in terms of transit, um, use and built form, economic development, and parks and recreation. And then additional details on all these are available through um, the reports that we have published. But um, people wanted comfort and reliability. Uh, culturally relevant identity and service was really important, and improved safety by design. Um, so one example of that, we heard that residents wanted ambassadors, people um, on the on the buses that they can interact with that could also provide a safety function um, in collaboration with police. And in fact, that's something that you may have heard recently has, has come online um, at RTA as a pilot project. So that ambassador program is moving forward. Um, in terms of use and built form, collaborating with local retail to better serve riders. What does that mean? Specifically, having more ticket access with local uh, retail establishments to make it easier for people to get tickets. Uh, focus on affordability and cultural identity. Removing barriers for equitable access. Uh, one of our mobile tours was uh, conducted in partnership with Maximum Accessible Housing of Ohio. So we had individuals that required the use of a wheelchair, individuals that are visually impaired, and we went up and down the corridor with them and got very detailed feedback on the kind of micro design elements that make their lives really hard um, to travel the corridor. So that was all implemented in the recommendations. Economic development, um, we'll hear a little bit more of that from, from Craig, and then parks and recreation. So the importance of, again, connecting, I think, to some of the comments that were made earlier about connecting this corridor to the existing assets and trails along the corridor. Um, and on the right, just a couple examples of the events that we had. Uh, we were able to, in a COVID safe way, have a couple um, in-person events with the Spanish-speaking community at Las Dos Fronteras, which was really effective and a great way to make a social um, you know, uh, environment for people to share their concerns and ideas that were embedded in the report. All right, Craig. Thanks, David. Uh, so we're going to get to the really exciting piece, which is our market and finance plan. Uh, so, uh, but it's really important for us to understand when we're talking about TOD, the realities of what actually can get built? What are, what are we really talking about when it's transit supportive? Uh, what is the what are developers uh, grappling with when it's things like affordable housing? What are the deltas uh, that that they're dealing with in their pro forma plans? And then doing a market scan also of the readiness uh, or what pressures exist and. I don't think it's any surprise to you, but, uh, uh, you know, Ohio City would, would be sort of that uh, market ready. It's super market ready. We're seeing a lot of uh, development happening without any assistance. It, it actually may need to have some conversation about displacement uh, within that community. But as you as you move down into the Clark Fulton area, uh, uh, because it's not seen as, as a sort of uh, market ready area or it, it requires a uh, uh, land assemblage within that that sense there there may be uh, toolkit pieces that we want to implement with low low income housing tax credit focusing our our CDC's efforts on 
um, rehabilitation, reoccupation. A lot of the things that you heard in the Clark Fulton plan are, are direct uh, conversations that we had with it within our uh, development community and, and, and uh, uh, finance piece here. So uh, we looked at updating the existing market conditions. We identified three uh, unique development geographic areas. That would be the sort of uh, Ohio City Tremont, Clark Fulton, Brooklyn Center, and then Old Brooklyn uh, uh, Center, or Old Brooklyn and Brooklyn Center sort of uh, feeding over there too, that had um, uh, broad, broadly the same sort of market conditions and we could understand what would be possible to build TOD within those, those pieces. So these are our key recommendations that came out of that. Uh, number one are financial programs. Uh, assisting uh, establishing a program, and I'm glad to hear Clark Fulton together talks about this too. Uh, I'm dealing. I'm working in Raleigh right now on a bus rapid transit project there, and equity and and uh, equitable development are a key piece there. And the one thing that we're learning even from there, and I just came off of three weeks of workshops uh, with the community, is um, uh, a storefront creating creating a, a a place that people can actually come and learn about the opportunity uh, of their if they're a landowner what their options are to participate in the growth of our community uh, if there are new uh, missing middle strategies if they want to add an accessory dwelling unit what does that look like how do we partner with local lending institutions and create a one a one-stop shop sort of exercise within that that can both be education but empowerment uh, uh, to build together so uh, when we say that that program, I think we need to really amp that up and say it needs to be a committed storefront physical presence that people can come and learn and, and, and grow together. Uh, a coordinating council, we're dealing across the entire corridor. There's multiple sort of community development corporations. We'd really like them to uh, come together in a concentrated way and talk about how, what does the near west side look like from, from tip to tail and how do they all participate in that growth. Um, creating that clearinghouse, uh, that is both that storefront piece, but I also think an online clearinghouse that people know their options within that. Uh, and then funding is uh, creating that uh, funding mechanism to assist TOD developments along the, the 25th Street corridor. There's a lot of great funding tools out there, but if we, we tweak that and, and, and understand both the uh, new development, mixed use right directly along the corridor, but also with 3,000 homes that exist along the corridor that are currently vacant. How do we how do we rehab and reoccupy those? What are the barriers within that that we can actually create opportunity for people living in these areas to uh, 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 build within within that community on on existing uh, infrastructure as well? So it was sort of a two pronged. Uh, exercise uh, on the market and finance, but the new construction and then uh, focusing in on infill opportunities. We did a, a deep dive in our zoning and policy review and thanks to Matt Moss and his team at the city, uh, you know, as they're going through their update of the form based code. Uh, this is a great opportunity for us to look at what's happening along the corridor. And so we reviewed things like the zoning code. Uh, we did a deep dive on the last five years of uh, variances and application processes along the corridor. Uh, and we did a typology review of existing built forms along the corridor. And we categorized it into three sort of areas. Existing buildings that we would consider TOD contributing or transit supportive. Uh, potential opportunities for TOD. So like this building here is an adaptive reuse opportunity. It's activated and animated. Uh, but maybe maybe there's some buildings that's, that exist along the corridor that, that may fit within that. And then the, the clear sort of non-contributing auto-centric pieces and understanding just how much of these do we actually have along the corridor. And the good news is a vast majority of the corridor is uh, primed or ready for, for TOD or is already sort of contributing in that sense. On the variant side, what we saw was a lot of the variances are about use change. And if we can, and one of our big policy recommendations is, is uh, in the in the zoning code update is to really examine those use change. Every time a, a retailer comes in, uh, they have to go go forward with a use change request or a parking request. So how do we lower the gate uh, within that just to make sure that we're really being about a transit focused uh, 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 corridor? Uh, and that we're we're lowering how many times people have to go in front of bodies when it's really just about uh, a new retailer or um, uh, a new use going within those spaces. So out of this, we we had uh, sort of two categories. We had the approval process recommendation. Uh, two two key items here. One is early consultation, and this is really about 
coordinating with RTA in the city, uh, one, one, one item we kept hearing is making sure we preserve opportunities for at station areas, making sure if we need to have additional setback requirements at particular areas so that we can uh, provide amenity, uh, walkability, extra wide sidewalks, plaza spaces, anything that, that would be uh, supporting that transit infrastructure. Just any new development that's happening along the corridor, a quick coordination with RTA and, C and City of Cleveland, just to go over that, and I can show you that in, in a minute, uh, a result that, that we actually did during this process. Uh, and two is simplify the process. Make sure everybody knows from the time I enter City Hall with an application to, to the time I get my building permit, what is that clear process? What are our expectations of developers when it comes to urban design and walkability and affordability and equity? And then the second half of our, our recommendations are the sort of zoning and design regulation piece. Um, number one is develop a new TOD overlay. Now this isn't, this is not to um, replace the, the form-based code effort, but this is really that interim condition. Uh, that there is a potential need to create an, a, a quasi temporary overlay district that helps um, uh, add the uses uh, that are seen the wide variety of variances uh, it, uh, making sure that they're by right if they're transit supportive uh, and allowing the city time to go through. And Matt, if you want to talk a little bit about that process here, uh, uh, how this would interplay with what, what you're what you're working on. Yeah, thanks, Craig. Again, this is Matt Moss with the City Planning Commission. I just want to build off of what, what Craig said and, and an important uh, connection to the Park Fulton Together plan when we started exploring target areas, pilot areas in the city with our consultants, uh, Code Studio, to look at implementing a form-based code in the city of Cleveland. Clark Fulton was one of the neighborhoods that we took them to, and they told us that you really need to have a conversation, you need a plan with the community before you can come in and start regulating the land uses in this new way. And so that was really clear to us in terms of what we needed to do in order to get to a point where we can start really revolutionizing how we regulate land use and development in these areas with a, a form-based code. And what, what these conversations have revealed are how we're spending our time now regulating use instead of form and how that's not meeting the needs of this community and it's not meeting the needs of providing this type of multimodal connectivity, not just in the Clark Fulton neighborhood, but along this entire corridor. And so whether it's an overlay or, or a implementation of the form-based code, what this plan is providing us, what the Clark Fulton plan is providing us is all the information and detail we need to then come in and start regulating with that new code and making it sure that it's fitting the context here in this community and the future that this community and the other neighborhoods along the corridor want it to be and need it to be in order to make this a, a successful mode, a successful corridor in the city of Cleveland. So it's really a watershed moment in terms of changing how we decide and what priorities and what outcomes we want with the tools we have as a city to regulate change. A, f a few other items concerning that zoning and, and design regulation, again, Clark Fulton together, I like when you tee up uh, ideas that we've, we've talked about, is that elimination of alley uh, closure processes and prioritizing alley improvements. The number one thing for us to be able to provide access to parking and create that walkability frontage that we're all looking for is making sure we use our infrastructure assets, our road assets, as an opportunity to hide parking, tuck parking, and, and alleys are, are the best way to do that. And if we continue to close them, we're gonna lose that, that, infra that badly needed infrastructure uh, uh, to make that work. Uh, number five is providing wiggle room for setbacks. This is really about at station areas, making sure that we're not just doing blanket zero lot lines, but understanding the contextual need to integrate transportation infrastructure with our built form and the relationship between those buildings. Uh, and number six is concentrating retail areas. We we have a historic retail street here. However, in it's in fits and starts. And so we want to make sure that the retail is successful in a walkable manner. That doesn't mean that retail can't extend the entire corridor, but let's recognize that our key intersections to prioritize those retail zoning zoning areas and really focus uh, a new tenants and existing tenants to, to make those a vibrant walkable place. Slide. So this is a real world, the real time example. Uh, the, the picture on the left, is everybody familiar with the TRIO uh, project? I'm sure you've seen it. 
Uh, so we we got engaged with them a little late in the design process. And the, the first uh, design we saw was this on the left. And the more we talked about them, we didn't, you know, we recognized they spent a lot of time and money uh, already designing this project. Uh, and for me, it's, it's understanding how can we make this more uh, focused towards the street and, and the intersection. And so in that conversation, we said, well, could you, since you're putting a retail space here, and the only way to access it is on a sort of side uh, uh, staircase there or come all the way around to a ramp piece. Uh, if people are waiting for a bus in this area, wouldn't it be great if we could have that sort of direct corner access to that retail space? So they, they, this was sort of the, the compromise within that is creating this little uh, corner edge and, and walkability, or sorry, little plaza space uh, that, that allows for that direct sort of uh, a connection to the retail and a, and a better interface. So, so these are examples of how having early on collaboration and coordination are these just little pieces that could potentially make our, our corridor more walkable or uh, retail centric uh, or transit oriented in, in, that, in that sense. BRT development, so a big piece of this was understanding the physical context of the corridor because it is a constrained site. Uh, uh, and uh, so we wanted to look at both operations currently today, station locations that were identified in the in the 2018 plan. Uh, do those still hold relevance? Uh, we still uh, have uh, some considerations in the, in the next piece, uh, particularly those those uh, yellow dots are existing bus stations and some were identified as potential BRT in the future. Uh, and so we, we still need to drive down on, on actual station locations, which is really what preliminary engineering is going to work on. Uh, but, but here too, we were trying to understand um, the, the transit guideway, uh, which is the dedicated bus right of way uh, that makes BRT efficient and fast. Uh, the good news here is we can, for the most part at, our, at this stage, we understand most of it can be provided in peak period and peak direction of operations uh, with the corridor. It does require some thought, especially in this highly constrained area, uh, which is also in our uh, Clark Fulton together plan uh, and, and, and moving that forward uh, and, and into the next design for consideration. We also looked at parking and in these little outlined areas our, our focus areas that we we just did some testing of both uh, transit oriented development, but also on the parking piece to understand parking supply. And so what you're seeing here are AM and PM peak period parking uh, uh, pieces. Uh, the, the dark blue are, are parked or and the light blue are the, the sort of available uh, supply of parking both on street and off street. Uh, Franklin has the, the, the sort of the highest constrained area in the Ohio City uh, with a large percentage of being utilized uh, currently. But even during the pandemic, when people were working from home or, or traveling elsewhere, uh, we have a large in, in the community supply of on street and off street parking. And that's going to be really important when we talk about decoupling parking requirements from residential development. There's supply that we could we could utilize in a better way uh, that allow us to make sure that we're still providing the right kind of parking storage, but maybe it's not necessarily on site. So we can we can really uh, provide that as an opportunity to continue to monitor that as as development occurs. We looked at uh, actual sort of physical design. This is what we would call our preferred station alignment. Uh, what is the what is the most ideal situation when we're dealing with a bus rapid transit platform? What are requirements uh, that are needed within that area? Very sort of high level uh, uh, articulation of that. But that's important for us to understand when we're going to the city and saying, be flexible with your setbacks, because we want to make sure that we have the the highest amount of walkability behind our platform pieces. We need to make sure that we have that that room and availability for both a 60 per, 60 foot or a 40 foot bus uh, in these areas to make sure that we're accommodating the right sort of uh, accessibility requirements, et cetera. And, it, and we did a, a, a block by block high level study of this so that now when we go into preliminary engineering, we have a base understanding of these sort of physical constraints. We also looked at TOD and the conceptual piece. How does this, how does all this sort of fit together? And so we put together uh, a couple of, of uh, uh, guideposts and understanding so we could do some test fitting. Uh, we looked at uh, parking requirements of one stall per unit maximum, regardless of, of its unit size, just to make sure we have enough parking supply. 
We installed a, a minimal of uh, amount of uh, parking requirements for visitor parking, knowing that that could uh, be mixed as well with our, our uh, residential parking requirements. The big piece here, though, is looking at no parking required for ground floor or retail uh, under 25,000 square feet. And this is important because we often have parking requirements for retail that are matching suburban standards. And so we want to just make sure that we can uh, lift that, that sort of use requirement burden because of the urban nature of this. Most of this retail is going to be walkable and connected, and obviously uh, that will continue uh, to require some refinement as we move forward. We also looked at market conditions, and I talked about this earlier, as understanding the density and the affordability pieces and the typologies of housing that could be uh, placed with this. And then lastly is that, that platform placement and understanding that mix between um, uh, uh, the BRT and uh, new development. We created TOD uh, supportive building typologies just to have a toolkit of, of uh, units that would meet market conditions, uh, knowing that some would have different densities along the corridor based on those market conditions. But broadly, we had things like townhomes. We introduced this notion of a stacked flat, which is sort of three units in one building, uh, each on one floor, which some of that does exist in, in older neighborhoods here in Cleveland. We have a more traditional multifamily residential building that would just be pure apartments, uh, office, and then we get into our mixed use, both retail residential, or maybe there's a possibility for retail plus office or residential in that sense. And so we did test fits uh, in our five areas. We're gonna focus in on the Franklin Station concept. This is the um, uh, Lutheran Hospital parking lot uh, and its proximity to Irishtown Bend. And in collaboration with Ohio City CDC, we thought this would be a great opportunity to talk about the principles of TOD in a, in a market that is, is seeing a significant amount of change uh, within that. But we also, I just want to pause, we, we did look at market conditions across each area and there's, there's unique opportunities that we want this to be a guidepost and inspiration for developers to come in and and we we introduce new typologies that meet the market conditions but as you can see some of this is surface parking part uh, down at the broadview station there's an opportunity for some shared parking uh, to reduce the parking on site and near proximity uh, but they're all just sort of guideposts so i just want to say these aren't final designs but they're just big ideas excellent so we, we did a very high level sort of massing study and understanding, and in particular with the, the um, uh, uh, parking lot, we would wanna understand how do we replace the existing parking? Cause we know it's a, a high utilized area. Uh, and how do we phase that? Because it's, it's, it's a big enough site that you're not gonna do it all at once. And we created this idea of sort of two above ground parking structures wrapped with uh, flats and town homes and a higher density uh, that matches the, the sort of new development that's happening along West 25th here in Ohio City that can uh, take, take, on, uh, take advantage of the views across uh, Irish Town and Park, but also be oriented right at, at the station area itself. And then we wanted to just sort of wrap this up into one diagram. How does this all fit together? What are those considerations? So when I talk about things like wiggle room for setbacks, having just a little bit of setback, uh, opportunity there at the corner, uh, the operation side, this one, because of its proximity and the, the space we have on West 25th, having um, cycle tracks in this area, which are already sort of uh, uh, conceptualized in other studies, uh, and then the proximity and interface with uh, Irish Town Bend itself, but always that, that key eye of guideway, um, station alignment, and, and that sort of best practices for uh, operations. Just going to go through a few little bit of our conclusions and next steps and happy to answer a few questions next slide uh so that trio example that we provided we want to formalize that process with city and rta and just make sure that that's uh, uh working well together uh identifying existing proposed development um that might benefit for that review and that that's on point as well uh, continue the dialogue with the community on transit housing and economic development needs. Our engagement process was robust enough that uh, we're, we're committed to that as we move into preliminary engineering. But that ambassador program, the ways and the tools and the techniques that we're using are going to be a continued uh, uh, process there. Uh, initiate their RTA is going to be initiating the preliminary engineering work for the Metro Health BRT and small starts uh, initiation as well within that. 
Uh, but the big action item here is developing an equitable TOD playbook uh, that will integrate sp specific approaches. This is meant to be a model of how we approach land use and transportation planning and other priority corridors. And so we want to take all the lessons we learned here and start to build that into an actionable TOD framework. Um, just going to uh, just reiterate here that there is still work to be done and want to note that City of Cleveland also has steps within this, uh, both with the comprehensive plan and how this would feed into it, but also that that land use piece uh, and, and that it can all happen concurrently while we're working through these engineering pieces. And I think that's one big lesson is making sure the design of what we're doing also meets the policy and, and, and intent of community planning within that. So I'm going to turn it back to Mary Beth to, to close out our presentation. Thank you for your time and listening to us. Basically, um, this is our process going forward. We do have one. Um, the, the approval today will help us proceed. Um, right now, we do have the funds and we are beginning to look at the scope of the preliminary engineer, the engineering design process for 25 connects. Um, that will give us environmental clearances, cost estimation. We're looking at 40 to $60 million for the cost of this segment. Um, and we have already funds identified in our capital budget for some of it. We'll be putting it on the tip and looking at NOACA and the FTA new start, small starts pot of funds for this project. Most importantly, we will continue to coordinate with all of you. We had a, a brief meeting on what should be in the RFP from the city's standpoint um, just this week. We will continue that dialogue with Clark Fulton, to, uh, Clark Fulton and, and Clark Metro Health and Metro Health, and we will continue going forward. Just to let you know what this project is, we think it'll look like, is more like Clifton, not like the Health Line. We'll have um, peak hour lanes on both sides of the street in the peak hour, designated for bus lanes. Our signal system will allow, hopefully, preemption, but vice priority and be state of the art. The stations will be stations, they will not be stops. They will have platforms. We've heard they will be safe. They will have amenities. Connections is important. RTA, I like to think about it just going up and down on 25th Street, but the neighborhood goes other ways. It goes through and through. And it's not only the roadways, but it's the people, the bikes, and the scooters. We have a hospital use in the middle of the section. So access for strollers, for wheelchairs, for all of that is very, very important. So with that, I think our team is ready to take any questions you may have. Commission members. If you could go back to the putting together slide, the one the rendering, just a question, um, I think um, about the, um, the protected bike lanes. So I, I believe that if there was a corridor that it might be possible to actually do this, this is a good one. Um, so I love this idea. I think the idea of doing something like this when you're also addressing the bus lane um, makes a lot of sense because you're already really dealing with the bus, which was one of the issues, I think, when we were talking about Lorraine, for example, um, as you're kind of going back in along the Lorraine Avenue um cycle track but um so i really really think this may be an area where this can get done as part of the project but can you address more specifically um how in this next phase which is always the phase when you get into preliminary engineering where some of this um starts to become more difficult because i imagine that this section of west 25th street varies so much that this makes sense if you can do it the whole way, as opposed to a very small portion. So have you, did you look at multiple sections and to see if the, this could continuously be done? You're right, we don't have the right way for the entire corridor. Um, right now with the Irish Town Bend and all the city, there will be a protected cycleway on the north end of the street, north side of the street by the Irish Town Bend Park. We will look at it, um, buses that we are talking, we spoke yesterday with the city that, yes, we can blend bus lanes and bike traffic. We'll continue to look all the way down the corridor. 
Again, we're meant this is already on the plan. We are doing this. This is what we are going to build a 12 foot both way cycle track on the north side of 25th Street near the Irish Town Bend area where that park meets 25th Street. Others will look at the city bike plans. We want to connect both through and down and up and down. Um, there are areas that are very constrained. I think they're like 67 feet by Metro Health. So we're going to really have to look closely at that. And I don't know, we do have stations that show cycle tracks behind it and protected lanes and then construct and station for prototypes that have a bike lane on the other side or not as constricted. So I can ask it made a different way. So because I knew that there were looking at one side up by the northern end, this shows, right, the protected bike lane on both sides, right? This section. So I have to preface this as a diagram. I, I this understand. was done in, in a time where it, it still sort of conceptually showed it, showed it on both sides. Okay. We're trying to understand spatial requirements here. So this doesn't make any recommendations on the on the bicycle infrastructure in, in per, per se. Okay. This was just understanding the spatial needs. You can easily take that that sort of green piece and and double the size on on the north One. side there. Uh, but that all requires that detailed work at preliminary engineering. Uh, okay. In that. Yeah, I guess or the point I was trying to make is that these systems work if they're um, consistent. So. The idea of the consistency is where I'm after, and and even at this phase, is is kind of having an understanding. If that decision was made up north by our Irish Town Bend, then it makes the decision already for down here, right? In terms of the fact that now you have to configure a street section. So I'm fine with it. I just wanted a little more clarification because I'd like to see this get done in whatever form makes sense, but also in a form that that could set the table for the bar. For the future of other streets in Cleveland and other streets that have transit on them. So I know you'll think about it, but you know, I I worry at the same time. Yeah, uh, Commissioner, I can like, this is Matt Moss again. I can add to that in terms of how we're working towards implementing what you're seeing. What we want to make sure is included in the scope from the very beginning are the minimums that we need to provide bike access like this and and really mobility device access like this as well as the bus access. So we're starting out with what we need in the scope to make sure that we have the, at, at the very least the minimums to make sure that these are priority connections. This is a priority connection for bus and for bike. But because we don't have a consistent corridor at the whole length, we need to make sure what we're working on is making sure that these connections are, that we're having low stress, all ages and abilities connections, regardless of what the actual implementation of that looks like, but making sure that that's a priority in planning how this connects down to Lorraine, how to go from Lorraine down to Clark, et cetera, as you go down the corridor. Yeah, and I have the same kind of questions that the line has, you know, coming into this bike lane from other directions, what does that feel like? What does that look like? Because the terminus is in the change in bike facilities is where you have the most conflicts. The other thing that I think about is where the bike facility is and what's the changes between that and the walking path because that's also another place for conflict and i think it's really really important especially when you travel down west 25th street probably as much as all of us do you know when you have scooters on sidewalks i can't tell you how many times i almost get whacked by a scooter you know if you blur that line too much from the walking path and the bike path you're going to have those scooters making those changes and bicycles making those changes which creates those conflicts. And so I think we have to become less car centric and more pedestrian bicycle centric. And if someone has to give, it, it's got to be the cars, not the people or the bicycles. And so reducing that conflict is, I think, of paramount importance. Yeah, and as we go into the design of what, the, what this actual design will be, it's something that we definitely need to bring back to you all in making sure that we're in constant consultation with RTA, with the communities that this will pass through to make sure that we're getting, we're achieving that design, that it is that it is low stress, that it is all ages, that it is meeting that need in a, in a cycle track function or perhaps some other uh, implementation that works for the quarter and is still achieving those goals. So that's that's gonna be a constant communication yeah, with, with everyone. Get, get off exactly. Um, 
I, I love the intervention you guys made at TRIO. Um, until such time we have a form-based code, I, I would ask that the planning department work with prospective development or developers to ensure that that happens. So it becomes a matter of course and not matter of fact, matter of fact. Um, so, but this is a great job. I, I, I love the way you guys layered, how you actually work with um, Metro to, to develop a comprehensive approach to this. Excuse me. And uh, kind of in no particular order, and I'm being the millennium and putting it all on my phone. Um, I, so, so just just in no particular order. Uh, first of all, thank you, and this is really exciting. And uh, just anecdotally, uh, the next gen schedule change, Mary Beth, has been uh, really transformational for me personally, and allowed me to be able to use RTA a lot more. I'd actually. Intended for this to be an RTA day, the universe said otherwise, uh, but just just congratulations on that and for people if they haven't had a chance to kind of re engage with RTA in the past couple months, I'd encourage them to do so. Um, I was on the health line last week and I know that signal preemption has been um, uh, kind of an ongoing arguably battle with city hall and, and I just throw that out there because as we. Build, bring this online and you know other transit across the city. I just want to offer myself as a partner to try to hash through some of those conversations. Um, I think the, the flip side of that would be for RTA to also uh, think through how whether it's all door boarding or a more digital payment to get people on the bus faster because because I know that 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 can uh, certainly slow down um, you know one's ride on transit. Um, there's there's the the meme of Elmo with the flames behind him, and that's typically what I use when people are parked in the bus lane. Uh, so I'd also love to see more towing of cars. Um, but uh, Director Collier, I think as this engineering as this gets deeper into the engineering plan, I like the idea of thinking about setbacks to make sure that there's sufficient transit waiting environment. As we begin to understand where those uh, exact stations would be, I, I'd, I'd hope that that's something that we can get ahead of. So that as projects come online, we're not having to bring people through a variance process or work through legislation, not because we are uh, in any sort of disagreement, just because that that's time and time is money. Um, something that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I understand I'm supportive of the idea of reducing parking requirements, uh, especially for small retail. I think practically. Uh, Many people, especially in the winter, still drive in Cleveland when they could walk because we have a, an issue with snow removal, especially on sidewalks. Uh, so I would encourage a conversation about how we plan to remove snow, not only within the transit waiting environment, but through the entirety of the corridor. Some portions of the corridor have a special improvement district in place. Others do not, uh, but there seems to be this urban myth in Cleveland that if you shovel the snow and someone slips and falls, you're liable. And the truth is that the city code uh, requires you to remove snow uh, or put down something to create some traction. But so I, I think that's a key piece and if we're really going to be a walkable city, uh, we, we need to start thinking through how to be a walkable city in, in February and, and not just in June. And um, my last comment, I know I'm just kind of throwing these out there and, and you can respond if you'd like. Um, throughout all of RTA, especially on this corridor, I'd love to see more language access. Uh, obviously, uh, Spanish is obvious. Uh, we have a growing refugee community. We're expecting about 600 to 700 people from Afghanistan coming in the next few months. And uh, in many ways, RTA is very intuitive. If you are from Cleveland, you're used to it. Uh, you speak English, but I'd love to think through how we can make RTA more accessible uh, for all members of our community. Uh, two more quick things. One, um, I think that although I was talking about the bike lane, I do think this rendering is powerful from um, kind of just a a North Star point of view, which is that if this kind of robust tree planted, color coded, those few things can happen, 
across the length of this. Uh, it, it can be transformational alone. Forget the TOD and the other developments. Like, even though that stuff is also equally important. So I just want to make that point that this, the implementation of this along this stretch, for me, um, does something north-south that is extremely necessary, period. So I think the preservation of this, that it does not end up with paint, just paint striping and, and that it has a few trees and it doesn't hold together like this, it won't do that. But if this can get close to this, from a north-south point of view, it will be transformational across the length of it, no question. My second comment is uh, sort of a, something I've been thinking about, and maybe this is for a next administration to think about, which is where the um, a lot of the, for me, falls apart once you hit traffic and engineering. So my idea is, <laughs> I have an idea for that which is a kind of a baseline, equitable, kind of a crosswalk minimum standard across this entire city that is adopted and that traffic and engineering has to ad adhere to just like they do level of service. And I'd like to see this planning commission actually adopt something that says you need, go ahead and meet level of service that you choose but there is a base level of service for pedestrians. And we ought to think about uh, passing legislation in this next administration that puts some teeth into that. So not for you, but it's for us. So I wanna put that forward is, what's it called the next 90 days or your first 90 days? First 90 days for us of the next administration, I actually really would think we should do that. It, if I may, just on your first, first of all, great comments. I, I really appreciate it. you're hitting, you're hitting everything that we had multiple hours of conversation on, and and I, this is exactly the kind of conversation we want to generate. So thank you for your comments. Um, the one, the one important thing to to your your North Star piece. This is the, this is the. Uh, because we have a wide corridor and we have availability with the uh, Irish Town Bend, we can, you know, have a little bit more breathing room and create that piece. Um, but two is, you know, this process and, and doing the preliminary engineering is FTA will only pay for certain things in a, in a bus rapid transit corridor. Uh, one of the things they don't typically pay for are things like streetscape improvements or uh, landscaping that ha that is new that that uh, wasn't sort of uh, replace uh, uh, typology. So what we're talking about in, in, the, in the preliminary engineering is costing out what is a full you know building phase to building phase reconstruction look like, and how does the, how does city uh, participate in that as well? Uh, because that is an important piece. Infrastructure isn't just about cars moving or buses moving, it's about the people as well. And to encourage people to walk, we need things like street trees to make sure that that sidewalk is, is Cleveland's hot in the summer too, uh, but uh, making sure that those street trees exist in, in a meaningful way. Uh, it may change in character as you go down the corridor, but making sure, to your point, it's consistent that we're connecting this entire corridor visually together, that we are creating those unique public art opportunities within that corridor and setting that framework during the preliminary engineering will be vastly important to make sure that North Star is complete in that sense. So, so thank you for your points on that. And I, I move to, I move to adopt the plan as presented. We have a motion second further discussion. Mr. Chairman. Yes, really quick, um, just to highlight a couple of points that was highlighted in the presentation uh, for our viewing audience uh, and also for uh, commission members. Uh, one, um, just a comment from uh, the staff level with respect to this particular plan. Um, one of the things that's critical uh, for us that the 25 Connects initiative did is not just look at the transportation corridor, but focus on the land side. Transportation is a land use and how it integrates with the lands that flank it is critical. That is also something um, we took very seriously and they also embrace with the regulatory framework along this corridor. Uh, on November 5th, you're gonna be hearing um, our preliminary uh, product 
uh, around form based zoning. So you'll be seeing sort of how those districts sort of uh, match up with some of the recommendations that you see uh, here um, with respect, respect specifically to transit oriented uh, development. Um, the other thing uh, with respect to uh, this initiative, and I uh, concur with Commissioner Curry about uh, the minimum standards. Uh, oftentimes, uh, there's a lot of advocacy <laughs> that has to take place uh, internally uh, with respect to uh, how we execute, you know, on these plans. And I think there's a lot of restraints uh, with respect to current rules and, 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 and policy. So respectfully agree with that. And then uh, lastly, um, with this emphasis, particularly in this intersection, um, we do believe that it is the land side investments that's gonna put the pressure to do this to a scale and a cadence that is on another level. And I think with our comprehensive plan update, uh, 21st century CLE, um, we're really gonna be looking deep with respect to the mobility you know, aspect of things long-term uh, for our city. So there's gonna be a real opportunity to set a new precedent um, and hopefully a uh, new administration or whomever capitalizes on that. The time is 1146 at this point, um, Mr. Chairman, uh, I'll allow you to go ahead with your vote um, and then wanna see if there's any audience or questions uh, from the chat before we close out our meeting. Thank you. So we have a motion and second, any more discussion? Michael, call the roll. Yes. 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 Yeah. Motion carries. Good luck. Thank you. At this time, uh, if there's any uh, comments or questions from the audience, uh, please raise your hand and we'll pass the microphone. No comments. Dro, is there anything in the chat? Nothing in the chat. Okay, we're batting 100 today. All right. Um, in closing, I would like to make a couple of comments. I would like to first thank uh, the members of the Cleveland City Planning Commission uh, for their continued commitment to our city and coming out to the community to introduce themselves to you. Um, we're gonna be doing this a little bit more uh, because again, the goal of bringing government to the community is important. I do wanna acknowledge someone uh, uh, who's representing the organization that was a big part of the uh, Clark Fulton Together Master Plan. Tiffany Graham, if you can stand, please. Uh, Land Studio um, was a huge, huge part of helping us to coordinate uh, our different entities and organizations. And uh, Tiffany was like the, not just the glue, the crazy glue <laughs> that you know kept everyone together and kept everybody um, on task. So thank you, Tiffany, for all of your efforts in keeping us uh, moving in the right direction. So thank you to Land Studio. Um, I also want to acknowledge the councilwoman uh, again, who has a couple of words to say, and then we can wrap up this session. Thank you. Thank you, Director. Um, once again, thank you for joining us today. Um, thank you, Planning Commission, for being here. I could not walk out of this um, building without thanking the core team. As mentioned, it's been two year uh, journey. Um, you, you, you see us laughing today and smiling, and but it wasn't always like that, right? Um, when you're on this journey, there's just a lot of you know conversations that happen. You may not always agree, but one thing that we all agreed on is that we want to move our community forward. And so this is such an, a moment to celebrate. And so I would be remiss walking out this building without thanking the core team. And so on behalf of the city of Cleveland, um, I try to get the perfect words so that, um, so that you would know how much I appreciate your efforts and working um, long hours and going above and beyond for the families of Ward 14. But it says the council the city of Cleveland, um, sincerely pleased to recognize, and my assistant, if you could come, Miranda Lease, so as we pass these out, um, and I'll have the name of the individual. So it says, devoting your time, talents, and energy as a member of the core team in formulating the Clark Fulton Together Master Plan with over two years of your unwavering commitment, unwavering commitment and dedication together with residents, other stakeholders, and civic leaders, you have envisioned a new path of building a vibrant neighborhood that can improve the lives and circumstances of those who live here. 
So from the bottom of my heart, I want to thank the core team and I ask you to come up so I could pass these thank you scrolls and hopefully take a photo. But um, I am very hopeful for the future of Clark Fulton neighborhood. And I think of us 10 years from now looking back and saying, we did it. Look at, you know, a stronger and healthier community. And this is a legacy that we're leaving behind. So if you could come up in here. So we have Tiffany. So we first have Tiffany Graham. Charkowski. Okay, here we go. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. And then we have Kristen Zolos. This girl would be on emails at 12 at midnight, sending them, reminding us of events. Um, the famous Ricardo Leon. <laughs> Thank you, Ricardo. Yeah. Um, Keisha Gonzalez. Thank you. Appreciate you. Gregory Zuka. <laughs> Thank you. And Freddie Collier, director. Here we go. Thank you. And resident. Um, Erwin Lowenstein is not here today, um, but I know he is online. So I have your scroll, Erwin. And we have a couple residents um, that are not present today. But once again, thank you. Um, and today, you know, we just have to kind of stop and celebrate. Oftentimes we complete something and we're off to the next thing, you know. Let's stop today and celebrate. Um, kudos to all. Congratulations. Thank you. Okay, thank you, and uh, Mr. Chairman. <laughs> okay, now we're adjourned. We were waiting for the picture. <laughs>